Hi, my name is Stuart Wienig, and this video is an overview of CA Network Flow Analyzer, also known as Reporter Analyzer. I'm also going to review some use cases. My blog at stuart.wienig.com has some tips, tricks, and best practices about all the products in CA's NetQS suite. I currently serve as a communications officer for the CA Infrastructure Management Global User Community. If you've been to the community message boards, you've probably seen my name all over the place. I've been working with all the NetQS products since 2006, doing anything and everything. I've done installations at over 100 different customer sites with all the products, and now I'm starting to branch into some of the new products that CA is adding in, like Polaris and Rubicon, the new versions of Infrastructure Manager and NPC. There have been quite a few posts on message boards about Reporter Analyzer and how Reporter Analyzer works with licensing. Several weeks ago, we had also had some customers having some questions about how to use Network Flow Analyzer. Sorry, Network Flow Analyzer is the new name. So if I flub up and say Reporter Analyzer, just understand I mean Network Flow Analyzer. But I'll probably say Reporter Analyzer more often than not. Let's talk about what NFA does. The architecture is diverse, but there are several main components. The first line of components is actually comprised of your routers. When you enable NetFlow on a router, it caches conversation data. So it looks at all the conversations going through the router and caches the information like source IP address and port, destination IP address and port, through what interface the traffic came into the router, through what interface it's supposedly going to leave the router, toss value, AS value, etc. Version 5 NetFlow captures a whole lot of information. Version 9 is even more detailed because it's extensible. So the router caches all this data in the route cache, and then we configure the router to actually export all that data out to NFA. In particular, we export that data out to the harvester component. By the way, you can either have a standalone reporter analyzer system, or you can break these out into separate, distinct servers. So the first server to receive data is the harvester. The harvester receives all the flows from all of your routers. Now, you can have multiple harvesters, so if you have a large installation, you'll have multiple harvesters, and then various different routers, probably per region, uh, will be sending to their designated harvester. So the harvester receives the flows and does some processing of the data. When it receives a flow from a router, the harvester will do an SNMP query of the router and the interface. So when we start sending NetFlow data to Reporter Analyzer, Reporter Analyzer will respond with, it a, with an SNMP query to the router. The main reason we do that is we want the interface names for the interfaces on the router from which we're receiving flows. When we look at our reporting, it doesn't really help us a whole lot to see the IP address of the router and the if index of the interface. Nobody uses if index to reference interfaces. That's why we have descriptions and names on our interfaces. So we do this SNMP poll to get the names and the interfaces. The other important thing that, w that we get is the interface speed or the bandwidth of the interface. That's actually pretty crucial because without the interface speed or bandwidth, we can't calculate percent utilization. We have to calculate percent utilization, so we need to bandwidth, and we use SNMP to get that. After the harvester has done some processing of the data, it's going to build its real-time database and it builds a Flow Forensics database. Now, I'm not really going to go into what the real-time database covers and what the Flow Forensics database covers. Just know that that's where those databases reside. They reside on the harvester. The next thing that happens is the data gets passed up through the master console. The master console is where everything really happens. It's where the reporting happens, where the configuration happens. It's where you link up to NPC. It's where your authentication takes place. It's the center. It's the master console for a reporter analyzer. Then you have the data storage appliance, which you can have X number of data storage appliances depending on your size. That's where the historical database exists. The DSA is not really that complex. It's just a server running MySQL and has a couple little services that don't do a whole heck of a lot. It's mainly our database server for NFA. So I wanted to go through an example of how NetFlow actually works. If anybody doesn't know, NetFlow and IPFix are basically equivalent. NetFlow is the Cisco name, and IPFix is the industry standard name. IPFix is based on NetFlow. So we have our scenario here. We have our user whose PC is named PC111, and his IP address is 1010.1.11. And he's connecting to our server over here through our router that has a serial interface and an Ethernet interface. Our server address is 1010.222. First thing we're going to do is enable NetFlow on the router. In this case, we're going to enable NetFlow on the router on the right, the one presumably in our data center, the one closer to the server. So we turn on NetFlow on that router, and when we do that, we're going to cache information about the conversations passing through that router. So we've got our user, and he's going to do his connection over TCP80. For example, the server's hosting its service on TCP80. 
the user's high random port is going to be something like 1025, and let's say for this example that they're both using DSCP0. So the first thing that happens is we get our packets coming from our user through the router into the server. As soon as that packet comes into the serial interface of our NetFlow enabled router, the cache gets an entry. In the NetFlow cache, what we see is, and this is a truncated table, there's a lot more to it, is the source interface, the source IP address, that's our 1.11, our destination IP address, which is 2.22, protocol 6, everybody should recognize protocol 6 is TCP, 6 for TCP, 17 for UDP, toss value of 0, source port of 1025, that's our user's TCP port, and destination port of 80, that's our server's daemon port, our web port on our server. Then our server starts sending back data to the user, which is great. As soon as the data crosses the NetFlow-enabled router into that Ethernet 0 interface, we get another entry in, in our NetFlow cache for Ethernet 0, and we can see the source IP address, destination IP address, protocol source port, destination port. Obviously, the source and destination are switched because the direction has changed. At this point, we have these two entries in our route cache, and then all we need to do is go and tell the router to export or flow these route cache entries out to the harvester. And we, then we can start tracking this information in Reporter Analyzer. It seems like since I decided to cover Reporter Analyzer, there have been a couple of posts asking about or with confusion about how licenses and NetFlow work together. So I'm going to take an example here of a router with four interfaces. We've got our WAN interface here at the top, serial 00, and we've got three fast Ethernet interfaces that are connected to three other networks. So when we go to our router and we enable NetFlow, what we're actually enabling in most cases, unless you're doing a special configuration, is ingress NetFlow. That means as data comes into the interface where NetFlow is configured, that is when the route cache is updated or created. So if we have enabled ingress NetFlow on the serial 00 interface, as a packet comes into that interface, the route cache entry is created. It doesn't matter where the packet is actually going, it could be going to fast Ethernet 1, 2, or 3, either way, we're tracking it as it comes into the serial interface. So we actually get information in the route cache detailing a source interface, which is where the packet came in, and a destination interface, which is the interface to which the packet is being routed. So it's where the packet's coming into the router and where the packet's going out of the router. So just by enabling NetFlow on the serial 00 interface, we get a complete picture of what's coming into that interface. We also get a partial picture of what's going out of Fast Ethernet 01, a partial picture of what's going out of Fast Ethernet 02, and a partial picture of what's going out of Fast Ethernet 03. However, what is really missing from this is our crucial interface 000, our WAN interface, which is going to be our most important interface. If we just enable NetFlow on the serial 00 interface, then we don't actually get any information about the traffic leaving the router through that interface. In order to get that, what we need to do is we need to go and enable NetFlow on the other interfaces. Particularly, if we enable NetFlow on Fast Ethernet 01, then we get a complete picture of what is coming into Fast Ethernet 01. We also get a partial picture of what's going out of Serial Interface 00, a partial of what is going out of Fast Ethernet 02, and a partial of what's going out of Fast Ethernet 03. If we continue this process and enable NetFlow on Fast Ethernet 02, that gives us a full picture of what's coming into that interface, and we get a little bit more of the picture of what's going out of Serial Interface 00. We, ena we enable NetFlow on Fast Ethernet 03, and now we get a full picture of what's coming into Fast Ethernet 03. But if you look up at the top at our Serial Interface, we now have a full picture everything that could possibly be going out of Serial Interface 00. And we also, by default, because we turned it on, have the picture of what's coming into Serial Interface 00. In this way, Reporter Analyzer actually needs NetFlow data from all of the interfaces on the router, or at least all of the functional interfaces on the router, because without that, we only get inbound traffic. So what we're going to do, because we're only interested in our Serial 00 interface, is we're going to send all of our flows to Reporter Analyzer and then use Reporter Analyzer to do two things. First, it's going to derive all the outbound traffic for all of the interfaces on the router based on all of the flows. And then two, we're going to tell Reporter Analyzer to only store the data for Serial 00. So we're going to ignore our fast Ethernet interfaces. We're not going to ignore the flows, we're just going to not store either the inbound or the outbound pictures for these interfaces. We're going to use the flows from the fast Ethernet interfaces to give us a picture of what's going out of Serial 00 and store that just for Serial 00. That's why NetFlow has to be configured on all the interfaces on a router. 
Now, there are some ways that you can do it. There are some advanced configurations that will change how you configure NetFlow. Luckily, Reporter Analyzer has been configured to automatically adapt to those. One of those possible scenarios is that you can turn on ingress and egress NetFlow just on the serial interface. Now, this is great because you'll get a full picture just by turning it on only that way. Now we have four interfaces with NetFlow enabled and sending to our harvester. The harvester processes the data to figure out what's going out of each interface on the router. Now there's a global configuration in Reporter Analyzer called Auto Enable Interfaces. When Auto Enable Interfaces is set to true, Reporter Analyzer will automatically allocate one of the free licenses for every interface that's sending flows. That means that we're going to enable every single interface automatically, and all that data is going to flow down into the data storage appliance. We're going to have four records in the database, one for each interface. Four records means four interfaces consumed. The other option for auto-enable interfaces is false. In this case, we can actually go in and choose, as the administrator, which interfaces we want to report on. This doesn't change the fact that we're still going to flow from all four interfaces, because we still need the outbound picture for serial 00. What this does mean is that I can choose to only check the serial 00 interface. When I do that, that means that the records that were there for Fast Ethernet 01, 02, and 03 are going to go stale. They're no longer going to be updated because that data is no longer going to flow into these records. However, one thing to remember, records in the database equals license count. We still have, in this case, four interface records in our database. That means we're still using four licenses. What we can do is we can go to the Reporter Analyzer Administration web page and delete these interfaces from the database. Now when we do that, our license count goes back to one and we've freed up those licenses. So now that I've talked about the overview, I want to talk about one trick that a good Reporter Analyzer administrator has in his tool bag. It's called application mapping. Application mapping is used for two different scenarios. The first scenario is when you have one application that uses multiple ports. An example of this would be Exchange or VoIP. Another reason to use application mapping is that we have a bunch of applications that use the same port, but we don't want to report on them altogether. An example of this would be web applications. There are a whole lot of web applications out there, and the number's growing day by day, and they all use TCP 80, or 443, depending. And we don't necessarily want to report on them altogether, so what we can do with application mapping is create rules that uniquely identify traffic either by IP or subnet, by TCP or UDP port, by toss value, or any combination of these, and we can reclassify that traffic. Instead of saying that this traffic came in on port 80, we can reclassify that to some other port. So let's look at some application mapping. The first example I gave of application mapping and the reason you would want to use it is when you have one application that is using multiple ports. Now, the great example of this is Cisco Voice. Cisco Voice uses even-numbered UDP ports above 5,000. So every time you pick up your Cisco phone and dial a number, you talk to your call manager who sends information back to you saying, connect to this other phone and send your leg on UDP port 5002 or 5004 or 5006, whatever the case may be. Now, every single call uses a different UDP port number, which means in Reporter Analyzer, since it organizes everything by TCP port or UDP port, that every single phone call could potentially show up as a distinct protocol. So you'd see every single phone call, and there are problems associated with tracking that many. Now, there are some things that Reporter Analyzer does to summarize the data that would lose some of that visibility. So what you would want to do in that scenario is use something like application mapping. You'd create a rule that says, if I ever see traffic using TOS 8 or TOS 16 or whatever TOS values associated with your voice traffic, instead of storing it in the database and labeling, it the, labeling the conversation as UDP 5002 or UDP 5004 or 5006, label it as UDP 65000, some number way up there that no one ever uses. Call it UDP 65000, that way all the traffic for all those phones gets put into one single bucket. It all gets reported as one single unit because that's what it is. It's all voice traffic. So we would create a rule by toss, and I'll show you exactly what we would do for that kind of rule. Now something to remember, this only affects the port number classification of that conversation. The original IP address is involved, and all the other data contained in the flow is unaffected. So you still have visibility into which individual IP pairs participated in the conversations. The next scenario I mention is where we have multiple applications using a single port number. This situation would be your web applications. You've got Outlook Web Access, SharePoint, 
you have um, this web orders application and they all use port 80 but they're not part of a single application they're not the same application at all so you don't really want them to show up grouped together as a single protocol the other thing about it is that if it does show up as HTTP, then the only way to tell the difference between these applications, the traffic these applications use, is to actually drill into that one protocol, port 80, and look at the host or conversations to figure it out. If this one is one of your SharePoint servers, then that's how much SharePoint traffic you have. If this is one of my seven Outlook Web Access servers, then it's OWA traffic. It doesn't really make much sense to go in there and do all of that manually. So what we'd want to do is create some application mapping rules that would take our web applications, split them out. And the way we uniquely identify this traffic is we'd say in our rule, if it's one of my OWA servers and it's port 80, classify it this way. If it's one of my SharePoint servers and it's port 80, classify it that way. If it's one of my web order servers and it's port 80, classify it some other way. Right? So it's IP addresses and port or IP subnet and port. So looking at the rules we would create for all three of these examples or both of these examples that I've mentioned, uh, let's say that my voice control traffic uses TOS 8 and my VoIP data uses TOS 16. That's how we've configured it in Cisco telephony and that's how we've configured the QoS in our routers. So what we would do is create a rule that says if TOS value equals 8, that's VoIP control data. I need to classify that as 65508. I use 65508 because TOS 8, 6508, easy to remember. Uh, and then my VoIP data, I would remap anytime TOS equals 16 to 65516. That helps me remember that it was originally TOS 16. That means that all my VoIP traffic, no matter what the original port was, be it 5000, 5002, 5004, etc., it's all going to show up as either 65508 or 65516, depending on whether it's control or data. And then my Outlook Web Access, my SharePoint portal, and my web orders, I simply create rules that look for an IP address and a port number, or socket. And then I remap them to my new port number, my new bucket, if you will. So I create a new bucket out there called Outlook Web Access with port number 65501, and I create my rule that says if it's either of these two IP addresses on port 80, Instead of showing it as port 80 traffic, reclassify it as 65501. Same thing with SharePoint. If I see any traffic for these original SharePoint servers, whether it's port 80 or 443, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to clump it all together. Take it all and put it all in 65502. For web orders, same thing. I see port 80 on my web order servers. I put it into 65503. Now, obviously, at the same time that you do this, you would want to rename your protocol. Luckily, in the most recent version of Reporter Analyzer, when you create an application mapping rule, it automatically renames the protocol for you. So all you have to do is create the rule, and from that moment forward in your reporting, your traffic is reclassified. Application mapping doesn't go back in time to remap your traffic, but it does do it from that point forward. Now we're actually going to get into the use case scenarios. I was asked to detail a little bit about what I would do if I had a new site. Uh, we have a new site, we need to find out what kind of traffic we have out there, have we provisioned the site properly, does the site have any kind of weird traffic, just what's going on at that site. Uh, this is an example of what I would pull up for that scenario. If I had a new site, the first thing I would do would be to go to NPC and create a new site group. Uh, I would create rules in that site group to include the router, the super agent networks, all the UC monitor locations, everything associated with that site into that group. Now there are a lot of advantages to that. The site group in NPC is very powerful. If you don't know how to do that, feel free to contact me. I'll have my email address at the end, or we can start a discussion on the message boards in the community. Anyway, so I'll have created an NPC site group and put everything at that site into that group. Then I drill into that NPC site group in NPC. When I pull it up, I'll see all kinds of cool stuff about the site. But the main thing that I would be looking for, since I want to analyze new site traffic, is the traffic usage tab on the site report. When I go over there, I see all kinds of information about interfaces at that site, particularly what it's going to show me are the interfaces over threshold. Interfaces over threshold is a table that shows me all the interfaces within the group that you're currently looking at that have crossed a threshold, whether that's 50% utilization or 75% utilization. Not only that, but it looks for a threshold violation to be at least a certain percentage of the reporting period. So if I'm looking at the last 24 hours, I can see only interfaces that are over threshold for a half of the day, or a quarter of the day, or at least one hour of the day. By doing that, I can really easily identify the interfaces that may be my choke points. I can see the interface at my site 
that may be my problem and I can drill into it. When I do, I can see something like this. I'm looking at this new site, which I don't know if it has some kind of new job function or whatever it is, but for some reason, this site is doing a lot of TCP 1787. And whatever TCP 1787 is, this site's doing a lot of it. Uh, luckily, the site has a 10 megabit WAN link, so it's really not that crucial. However, I do have one point around 2 o'clock where I did have a spike above and beyond the 1787 traffic that included Exchange. And if you look at Exchange, you'll notice, uh, as a side note, uh, that it's TCP 65000. That's because I've got an application map that takes all my Exchange traffic, categorizes it all as one single unit, 65000. So there's a good example of an application map. So by looking at this stack trend plot here, I can tell exactly what's going on at that site and whether or not I'm reaching my bandwidth limit. If someone were to tell me that only half the users at the site are actually online and within the next few weeks I'll be bringing the other half online, I would say we're probably going to have problems. If this is normal, we're going to have problems when the other half of the users come online. Whatever 1787 traffic is, whatever custom application it is, we could expect twice as much traffic, which would cause congestion on this WAN link. So we'd want to talk about WAN compression, more bandwidth, or whatever other mitigation efforts we can employ. The next option we'd have would be to reduce peak WAN traffic. This falls kind of in the same place. This is where I'm being reactive. Someone comes to me and says, hey, the network is slow at such and such site. Uh, we think we're out of bandwidth. Well, I would drill into that site and look at the WAN interface. If this is a 6 meg link, we're definitely having problems. If it's a, hundred, a 10 meg link uh, and everyone is already doing everything they're going to do, I don't necessarily think that bandwidth constriction is the problem. I do see that we do have riverbed, but it's not a whole lot of traffic. Much of the traffic going through this interface isn't being optimized by riverbed. I may want to go to my riverbed administrator and ask if there's anything that can be done about optimizing the 1787 traffic through the riverbed. This is reactive. Someone tells me there's a problem in a certain place, and I go directly to that place to investigate. The next scenario would be to reduce peak WAN traffic being proactive. This is where I don't necessarily know where my problem might be, but my boss has tasked me with making sure we're not going to have any pain points and that we don't have any kind of bandwidth problems now because we're about to be acquired or we're about to implement a big change or we're about to do something that's going to change everything and we want to make sure we're good before that change. This is where there are two things that I would look at, and they're both on the Enterprise Overview page. Looking at the Enterprise Overview, I see the routers with the most NetFlow traffic. That shows me the routers that have the most NetFlow traffic. This is where I have the most NetFlow traffic all over the place, everywhere. Um, and I can drill into that to find out exactly what's going on. Why do I have so many flows? Why does this router have so many flows? Um, and I can determine if it's something that even should be happening. The other thing that I can look at would be my interfaces over threshold. This is where, like I said, we can look at utilization levels above 50% or 75% uh, for at least 25% of the reporting period. In this case, I have a reporting period of 24 hours. 25% of that reporting period would be 6 hours. These four interfaces that are listed here were at least over 50% or 75% utilization for the last for at least 6 hours of the last 24 hours. And I can see that most of them were over my 75% threshold for most of the time. The first interface, which is only a 6 meg interface, has an average utilization of 42%. However, it spent 31% of the last day, that's almost a third of the last day, over 75% utilized. That tells me that we have really high utilization during one-third of the day, which could correspond to business hours, and very low utilization during the other two-thirds of the day, which could correspond to after hours. That's where I would start to be proactive. I would pull up this report and maybe email it to myself every day. Uh, this would be the kind of thing where I would start, uh, start off my day looking at this to see if there are any things that I need to look at that may be trending. The same thing is happening every day. Um, I can look at it over a week or over a month. The other option, which I didn't really include in this video, is a growth report. You can actually do projections with Reporter Analyzer. Based on the data that Reporter Analyzers gathered in the past, you can actually then configure Reporter Analyzer to do a projection into the future to see what those values might be. Um, and the nice, that, nice part about that is that you can actually project individual protocols. If you know what you've got, that you've got this uh, voice traffic, and this is how much it's grown in the last two months, uh, you can ask Reporter Analyzer to show you what it's going to look like uh, in the next two months. 
The next area scenario we're going to look at is understanding pain points. This is using Reporter Analyzer to help us understand why people are having problems and what problems they may be experiencing. We diagnose slow network performance, bandwidth hogs, bandwidth utilization, uh, anytime we have a clogged pipe really. This is where a calendar chart comes in really handy. Looking at a calendar chart, you can see over, in this case, a month period, you can see at exactly which times during every day you had high utilization. Obviously, in this case, we can see we had some high utilization actually at night in the inbound direction, so coming into the router through the 6 megabit WAN interface. That would be because of, I don't know, net backups, whatever it may be. But this, in this scenario, is not actually my problem. If I look at the other direction, the traffic going out of this interface, I can actually see the real problem. Users have been complaining that the network is slow around lunchtime. If I look at this, I can see why they're complaining. They're complaining because the bandwidth utilization is really high every single day. And I'm not talking about just the days when people are at work. This is every single day of the last month, from the hours of around 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. We've had really high utilization, above 80% utilization on this link. By seeing that this happens not only during business days, but also during off days, that clues me into the fact that this may be some kind of computer batch running at noon or something. We may want to look into that. From here, I could drill into this same interface and look to see, perhaps at noon today, who the heaviest hitters are. I can see what the top hosts are, what the top conversations are, and that can point me to which server is pushing out a whole ton of data during the middle of the day. Turns out this problem was actually antivirus updates. Somebody had scheduled antivirus updates to go out every day at noon, um, and because it was configured that way, the server was just going crazy at noon, pushing out all these updates every single day. Everybody was suffering. Luckily, it was around lunchtime, so everyone would just give up, go to lunch, and by the time they got back, it'd be done. Uh, but the company basically ground to a halt. So by looking at the calendar chart, I knew that it was something non-human, and then by looking at the top host, top conversations, I was able to determine the source, the AV server. And then, I, then by contacting the AV administrator to ask what happens every day at noon, I found out that it was an antivirus push, and that was the start of going to get things fixed, getting that rescheduled to something like 11 p.m. when nobody would notice it. The next area is detecting unauthorized WAN traffic. This is where you've got policies in place to block certain disallowed traffic, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, whatever it may be. There are various different ways you can do it. The easiest way is to look at the top enterprise protocols by volume. That tells you which protocols are your heaviest hitters. By looking at that, you can see in this situation, for example, we have TCP 958 and TCP 10566. I would want to drill into that and look at perhaps what those applications are to figure out whether or not they should be allowed. If they're not allowed, I can easily go into a firewall system, change a firewall rule or a proxy rule, and then come back here and verify that the volume starts to drop, drop off. There are a couple of different reports that you could run. You could run a custom report. Let's say, for example, I'm interested in this TCP 958 protocol. I can run a custom report including all of my interfaces and filter it to just TCP 958. That would give me a really good focus on just what protocol, on just that protocol, everywhere that it's happening. Another option would be to run a custom report on all my WAN interfaces um, and include all the protocols. This would take out all my non-WAN interfaces and just look at the small WAN interface, the relatively small WAN interfaces. The other option would be to look at an interface utilization summary, either an MPC from the Enterprise Overview or the Network Summary. Both of these interface utilization summaries would give me a good idea of where I might have unauthorized WAN traffic. The best example I have of detecting unauthorized WAN traffic actually comes from back in 2007. Everybody remembers the Michael Jackson funeral was broadcast on the internet. I was working for an NetQS customer at the time and the policy was that no one was supposed to be watching the Michael Jackson funeral. So they thought they had put some policies in place to block that traffic. And then they came to me asking to use Reporter Analyzer to make sure that their policies were working as designed. So I went to the Michael Jackson funeral myself and looked at my own system to determine which protocols were in use. Turns out there were two protocols, the real-time streaming protocol and a peer-to-peer -peer flash protocol. CNN was doing the coverage and they have a really cool peer-to-peer -peer system set up for streaming flash video. So by knowing that, I was able to build a custom report showing me all of the traffic and whether or not it clogged up any of my internet, internet pipes. I was also able to pull up a host list. And the host list actually turned in to be a list of the offenders. 
So if we look at that report, we can see that although the funeral started at noon, people at this company actually started joining as early as 8.30. At one point, we were up to 14 megabits of Michael Jackson funeral streaming, and this ended up not being that huge because our internet pipe was much bigger than that. We had a 45 megabit pipe. But it did mean that people were wasting time watching the funeral when they should be working. Uh, this became a really great report that I could hand into management to show how much traffic there was and a list of the IP addresses that were actually participating. Um, after this, we were able to identify some better policies and show the proxy team that the rules that they had implemented hadn't worked because it still happened. The next scenario is detecting anomalies. Everybody that owns or Porter Analyzer should have anomaly detector installed and monitoring at least one of your harvesters. Anomaly detector is licensed for one source or collection device. If you buy Reporter Analyzer, you have at least one harvester, and you can download, install, and add Anomaly Detector to NPC. Then the only thing you have to do is configure it to look at a particular data source. Technically, you can use Anomaly Detector to search for anomalies within SuperAgent, NetVoyant, um, but Anomaly Detector is best suited for monitoring NetFlow data. So you configure Anomaly Detector to look at, the particular, at your particular harvester, and when you do, AD looks for quite a few different anomalies. This top enterprise-wide network anomalies view is one of the views that Anomaly Detector gives you an NPC after you have it installed, showing you how many of each type of anomaly have been detected. Some of the triggers are high and variable volume and into a router, high and variable volume out of a router, uh, large ICMP packet sources looking for things like ICMP tunneling, uh, high flow sources like anything that has a f high flow count, well it means it's participating in a lot of conversations. Each IP address pair generates a different flow. If you have one system that has 2,000 or 3,000 flows, there's really no reason for one human person to be talking to that many different systems, unless he's some like DNS or LDAP or some other system-wide service or network-wide service like that. Uh, more triggers. Uh, fragmented packet sources, uh, high packet fan out, that's where you have many packets going out from many different sources, uh, previously null routed sources, etc., etc. So there are a bunch of different triggers that Anomaly Detector looks for. The nice thing is that all you really have to do is install it, point it to a data source, and then look at the reports. Once you look at the reports, just drill into the one you think you're, you're interested in, um, and, and you'll see the information. At this point, I would drill into the high flow sources, right? And I would see a report showing the flow count for the IP addresses that have the highest flow sources and the confidence interval that Anomaly Detector calculated. The last scenario is validating QoS parameters. This is where you would want to make sure that the application is using the QoS markings that you think it's using. This is where you make sure that your voice data and your voice control data, uh, your voice control traffic, are prioritized above other less latency sensitive applications. So there are two ways to do this. The first is to run a custom report that shows you a protocol summary filtered by QoS tag. So I'd run a custom report showing me all traffic where QoS or two toss equals eight, and the report type I, I would want to run is a protocol summary. And what you would see is a list of all the protocols using toss eight. In that report, you should only see phones, call managers, voice gateways, you know, barring soft phones. Um, if you see other hosts using TOS 8, then you got a problem. Uh, the other option is to look at a protocol that you know is supposed to be in a particular queue. You can run a report filtered by that protocol, and the type of report to run is a QoS summary, and this tells you what TOS values are in use by that protocol. So I've got a couple of examples here. The first one on the top is a report that I ran looking for one protocol. I wanted to know for that one protocol which TOS values are used. It turns out for this one protocol, there were two TOS values being used, 8 and 16. And that brings to light perhaps a configuration problem. Why would one protocol be using two different TOS values? Right? Are my routers not tagging it properly? Is my application misconfigured? Who knows? Um, the graph on the bottom is a report that I did showing me just what traffic is using TOS 8. Right? So this is a summary of the protocols running on TOS 8. And when I look at that, I see SSH. Well, that's the main protocol, the, the big one. Um, so really, I mean, why does SSH need QoS prioritization? It's not that latency sensitive. Now, FTP data definitely does not need prioritization. The fifth protocol in the legend uh, is MSDS. The next one's 3306, MySQL. Some of these protocols don't need to be using TOS 8, and they don't need to be prioritized. 
really an additional couple of milliseconds of latency on those protocols won't make a difference. Now, I realize there are some situations where applications are granted gold, silver, or bronze status, and that may be the case here. Uh, what I would need to figure out is whether or not these protocols really should be using TOS 8 and, and really should be getting prioritized. So this has been my presentation on CA Network Flow Analyzer or Reporter Analyzer. Uh, I hope the video has been helpful. Um, please subscribe to my blog, stuart.weenig.com, um, uh, for more videos to come in the future. Thanks, and uh, have a great day.